I made my previous talk a little short, so give me some time to talk about after Robert talked. Um, and there's several things I'd like to try to cover with that. Uh, one is that I'd like to try to explain how an awful lot of research is, goes out. And, and that is that right now we're sort of in the, I would call, observational phase of a research. We're trying to learn a lot about the disease at the, at the molecular level. Not symptom level, the molecular level. And all these talks, that's what it's about. Collecting that information. And then what sometimes happens, and this is not improper thing to do, because you're trying to understand it, that is you take those observations and you're trying to understand what's going on. And so you start to propose a hypothesis of what may be going on. And you go and look at all this data and say, oh, this one supports it. Oh, but this idea, this supports the idea. And, you, and that's called cherry picking. Now, it's not a horrible thing to do because if you, if there are enough cherries that you can pick and it kind of supports the idea. Uh, that's useful because it says, well, it's possible that this might be the explanation. But it's not really useful uh, a demonstration that it's right because you cherry picked. <laughs> so what you really have to do is to say is if this idea is right, then it predicts this will happen. There's no bias in this. I haven't cherry picked anything. You, your back is up against the wall. This has to happen or I'm wrong. Right? So that's just what Robert just did. He said if this trap is right, it predicts these things. Now, what usually happens when you do science is you've just shown yourself <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and so um, uh, that's what science is all about, a, a constant disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now that doesn't prove he's right, but it's very strong support because it was done in a, such an unbiased fashion. So then what you do, of course, six patients, well, maybe the, 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 that's really probably not enough. So what we need to do is do more patients. Well, that will add to it. Seems to be a constant theme. Now, I mentioned a biomarker. Well, this ratio that he's showing you is a biomarker. Now, it's a really good biomarker if it turns out that's what's causing the disease. Because now we're right at the heart of the initiation of the disease. If, if you have that, you have the disease. If you don't have it, you don't have the disease. That's perfect. And it doesn't matter. Uh, and if another, another disease shows that, well, they have it too. Because it's, it's, it's exactly what's causing the disease. So this is one of our problems that we're kind of struggling with is in our, our biomarker testing we have to go and look at other diseases like MS with our biomarkers. And then we started thinking about, okay, what happens if they show the same thing as MACFS? Does that mean, well, it's not, a, it's not a very specific biomarker? Well, not necessarily. It also means that maybe they have MACFS. And there's nothing saying you can't have two diseases at the same time. But it also could mean the fact that something like MS could actually be caused by initially having chronic fatigue syndrome. You have to have it for six months after all to be even diagnosed. So it's possible that your immune dysregulation, because we see T cell activation going on, actually causes MS. Now when you talk to the uh, immunology people, is that possible? And they said, well, yes, but no. And I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, because, yes, it's certainly possible that that happened, but no one, no one would ever consider it. And that's because if you have all the symptoms that you have are caused by the one disease that they've diagnosed you with. You can't possibly have two. So it would never be considered that you have uh, MECFS as well. And so that's, it's, it's hard to figure that out, but if we can figure out the real cause of this, and this is really what the cause is, then we can tell you, you know, you also have uh, MECFS. 
Now there's a value in that from the point of view of funding because now you've just upped the number of people who have it by a lot, <laughs> right? And so uh, this is why we really want to push this a, a lot to try to see if it's right or not and do more patients. Now the other problem we have is that we want to do some modeling. And what I mean by modeling is we want to try to see if we can reproduce this in, in a cell culture. Uh, what we happened in the, uh, at our, at our, at our uh, uh, working group meeting the last three days is one of the scientists I invited and said, heck, I will make a yeast model for this. It's going to be really easy. All I got to do is take out the genes from yeast to do this and replace them with the human genes. That's actually pretty easy to do. And it's very likely that they'll work. And then someone else came up to me and said, you know, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll make the, a model of this in the nematode. All I got to do is convince a graduate student to do it. <laughs> it's easy, right? <laughs> uh, and then uh, another person at the meeting said, uh, I'll make a mouse model. That's what getting these people together means. And those can speed up the experimentation and we don't have to get, because it's hard to experiment on people. But, uh, one of the components that we need is canurinine. Uh, not easy to find. And it's not been tested in human use. And so we've looked hard for that. So when Jonas was there, we were talking about this problem. He said, oh, no problem. And Uppsala, we just made a bunch. And we've tested it on humans. It's being tested in clinical trials for migraine headaches. So, I said, okay, you get to do the experiment. <laughs> we'll send you our protocols, so you, and you, but you need a mass spec, mass spectrometer to test the patients. Now, you should, did he show you all those mass spectrometers he has in his lab? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, uh, but that's what getting together uh, means. And especially when people are really focused on a problem, trying to solve a problem. This is more about the patients than it is the scientist. And that's a great state to be in. Um, so this is, this is all about trying to solve a, solve a scientific problem. So that's why I'm excited about it, right? We have a path forward. We know that it might be wrong. Very common when you have something like this uh, that it is wrong. But sometimes it helps you get to the right answer. Now, what, what we found here is that tryptophan is high. Why? And we've, what we've also found is that carnarinine is low. That's not, that's not a hypothesis. That's an experimental measurement. And the experimental measurement also says that the enzyme IDO1 is inhibited. That's not, that's real. That's what's actually happening in, in, in these patients. Why is it inhibited? Now he's, Robert has a hypothesis, it's the trap is inhibiting it. Could be something else. But if we find that the trap's not right, then what is inhibiting it? So you see how it goes? That leads you. Now, is it significant that tryptophan is high? Well, maybe because maybe serotonin will be high. But the other thing is that carnarinine is low. Is that a problem? Absolutely. Why? Because carnarinine makes a compound called NAD. NAD is used in 400 reactions in your body. All 400 of those are not gonna work very well. Is that gonna make you sick? You bet it will. <laughs> in addition to that, it's necessary to make ATP, which is for your energy. It's a very important molecule and it's low. So, uh, and, uh, and there's one more thing. And that is, canurinine levels controls the immune system. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so it, without canurinine, you can't suppress autoimmunity. Does that one sound familiar? <laughs> so is, now that doesn't mean that that's what's happening, right? But it gives you a path forward. So Michael's very aware of this, and we're gonna to try to incorporate that and maybe do some testing of that type. We need to figure this all out. 
but we're in a great position to do that. Um, <clears throat> I think this would be an important point to set, point out that uh, to do all these kind of things, the rate limiting step in all of this stuff is having enough funds to hire enough people to do it. And uh, you've seen, uh, he mentioned Julie is one of the best pair of hands, the best pair of hands I've ever seen too. And not surprising, she's involved in half a dozen projects because we need someone really good to do it. So he has very limited time. We have a really good person with mass spectrometry. He, he's able to do 7% of his time can be devoted to this project. So that's why it's taken months to do this stuff. We don't have enough people. And so uh, if there's any big donor out there, this is the time to give the money, I gotta tell you. We gotta figure out, is this right or is it wrong? And we wanna do that as fast as we can. And then if it's wrong, move on to the next idea. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention is the fact that uh, it hasn't escaped our attention that we're talking about tryptophan and things that you can buy. And what happens usually with patients, if they see, oh my gosh, that might make me well, and they start experimenting. This is a dangerous pathway to experiment on. We know, for example, if you take tryptophan, you can actually cause autoimmunity. And that autoimmunity is not necessarily curable by, by present technology. And when we were talking about some of this stuff uh, a couple nights ago with the, with the people there. And one, point, one person pointed out, yeah, it's really dangerous when patients start experimenting because there was one possibility that with a disease and uh, they needed a particular drug, but it wasn't available. So they, had, they, they contracted a company to synthesize it to them and they gave it to them because that's got, that is not tested in any animal models and stuff. And they took the drug and it killed part of their brain. And they became totally paralyzed and then died. So it's really dangerous to, to self-experiment on, on, on you without really the people who know what's going on. That's why, we have, that's why we're so strict about uh, drugs and we have to be tested. And if you make a new drug or a new company makes the same drug that's been made before, it has to be tested because you can get yourself into big problems. And so I'm urging people to not experiment with this pathway. <laughs> Uh, let us, give us some time to figure it out. And you can see some immediate problems. If this is all true, the tryptophan levels can be very high, which will make your serotonin levels very high. And the problem with that is that the body will self-adapt to that and it reduces the level of receptors to make you less sensitive to serotonin. And if you try to get yourself out of the trap, and this is what we have to be really careful about, your body's not used to the right level of serotonin. And what, what is it gonna do to you? It may be awful. We don't know. It's certainly involved in the brain and we just don't know what would happen. And, and the problem is by self-experimenting in these kind of critical pathways, you could make yourself much, much worse and that whatever you did to yourself might not be curable. So I'm just urging people, please don't self-experiment. Give us the time to figure out the right way to do it. And that's what we'll be trying, if we think it's right, that's what we'll be trying to do. And we're gonna be working with the doctors and we're gonna be working internationally with this thing. And, uh, and I'm hoping it's right because it would lead to a, an effective treatment and it might even lead to a cure but we have to test it. And we have to build the resources to do that. So thank you very much. <laughs>